In Good Company. Written by Jen Toronto. Narrated by Nancy Peterson. 1. Long Island, New York. July 1882. Consider yourself dismissed. Effective immediately. Miss Millie Longfellow squinted against the bright light that suddenly filled the cluttered broom closet she was standing in, resisting a sigh when Mrs. Cutling loomed into view. Swallowing past the lump that had formed in her throat, she took a hesitant step forward. Forgive me, ma'am, but did you just say dismissed? Indeed. But why? Planting a hand against a fashionably clad hip, Mrs. Cutling, Millie's employer for all of one week, narrowed her eyes. I would think the reasoning behind your immediate dismissal is obvious. I'm afraid not. Mrs. Cutling's eyes narrowed to mere slits. Did I, or did I not, hire you to watch after the children? Oh, yes, of course, but... And you believe you are doing an adequate job of that watching as you lurk in the dark depths of this broom closet? Oh, I wasn't lurking, Mrs. Cutling. I was simply biding some time in a location that was certain to keep the children out of view. Should that make me feel more disposed to keep you on? I don't exactly understand what disposed means, ma'am. But since I was only keeping out of sight so that the children wouldn't think I was cheating as we go about playing a rousing game of hide-and-seek, then yes, I do think you should allow me to keep my position. Millie smiled. While it might seem as if we're only playing, we're actually working on mathematical skills. You'll be pleased to learn that little James, being only five, was the one who suggested I... Currently being the seeker, count all the way to one thousand before I start looking for him and Edith. Mrs. Cutling's lips thinned. I'm sure James has no concept of how long it would take for you to count to one thousand. Furthermore, you should have known it was hardly wise to leave the children to their own devices for that extended amount of time. They wanted to be sure I'd be out of the way long enough for them to find a proper hiding place. And find one they did. Mrs. Cutling moved closer to Millie and took a vice-like grip on her arm. Millie didn't so much as flinch. Through her many years of service, she'd had cheeks slapped, hair pulled, and once a warming pan tossed directly her way. She'd been lucky to dodge the hot coals on that particular occasion. But in all fairness... She hadn't truly blamed her employer for throwing the pan, since Millie had unintentionally set the lady's bed on fire with it. What she had learned, though, through all the violence she'd suffered over the years, was that the slightest reaction seemed to bring some of the high society ladies she worked for great satisfaction. That satisfaction was normally followed by more violence, which was why she was very careful to keep her emotions in check these days. Fighting the urge to dig in her heels when Mrs. Cutling began tugging her away from the broom closet, Millie soon found herself hustled through a series of dark and narrow passageways. To her surprise, instead of escorting her through the kitchen, a place that was certain to bring Millie unwanted speculation from the cook and scullery maids, Mrs. Cutling pulled Millie down a bright hallway that had numerous crystal chandeliers hanging from the thirty-foot ceiling. Before Millie had a chance to remark on the beautiful paintings lining the wall, she was marched through French doors that led to the back garden. Heat immediately began traveling up her neck when she stepped out onto the tiled courtyard and found herself pinned under the disapproving stairs of at least ten society ladies. All of the ladies were dressed in the first state of fashion, their day dresses cut to perfection, while stylish hats embellished with ornamental feathers and large brims lent delicate skin protection from the summer sun. As you 